we did profile Wendy on a Saturday in my report, in my blog. And Wendy made sure uh, to say, and Marianne, take credit for that, that it was the leader, the joint leadership between the two of you and also the teamwork with the rest of the people in the home that really made things work as well as they are working. So with that, kudos to you guys. If you can uh, go uh, ahead and present uh, in uh, sharing uh, the, um, the tremendous work that you, had, that you have done at Greenwood Court. To both of you, Marianne and uh, Wendy, welcome, thank you. And I love the pictures with the mask. Now, one of you sent on an email to me, I'm too old for that, that was Wendy. Yeah, well, that was me. I must say that with the mask, you look extremely young. I look young, so and this here helps. You go. Here this you helps go. even more. You don't you see the gray hair. Yeah. You look fantastic. Yeah. You look fantastic. Go ahead. Well, this is some of the treats that we get. You won't believe the people that make you stuff. I don't know if all, all the nurses online have been in outbreak or not, but uh, it's just the, the support we get from the community is overwhelming. So we all sport caps and headbands and all this wonderful stuff now. So That's anyhow. I'll get talking. So I am the nurse practitioner. Marianne is a uh, director of care. And then there's another one that should be on this. Her name is Sherry Lemke. She's our infection control and assistant DOC that has also been part of kind of steering the nursing through this. So, um, but she left, she's got two young kids and needs to do school at the end of the day. The other thing I will tell you is we've been in outbreak now for three weeks. Are we on almost four weeks? We would not have had time in the first two weeks, I would say, to even think about doing this. So um, we're at a point where we can now stop and share a little bit. So we'll just go through the slides. I don't want to talk too long. Um, so do I flip slides or? Okay. So our home's located in Stratford, Ontario. We have 45 long-term care beds. We're quite a small long-term care home. Our one unit, our 30 bed unit, um, the colonial unit is our unaffected unit. And the 15 bed unit, our memory care or dementia unit is where our outbreak, where most of the cases occurred. We also have two non-funded beds in our home, meaning we can fill them without having to go through the LIN. However, because we have retirement in our home, those two non-funded beds fall under the retirement regulatory home authority. Those two beds are loaded, located in our colonial unit as well. We also have an 18 bed retirement unit, which is our second floor above the 30 bed unit. And that's where our first case of COVID was identified. Next, yeah. Okay, so we're just gonna walk you through, I guess what I found in speaking to other people, they just wanna know what happened. What happened? Um, so March 30th is when we started, a resident came out, high temp really was his biggest symptom. Uh, that resident was swabbed. We actually got the result back the following day, which is incredible. It came back very fast and uh, he was positive, a uh, member up in the retirement home. That same morning, a resident in the heritage unit, uh, also with a high fever, uh, was swabbed and that result came back the same day. So we had two original people in outbreak, one in our 15 bed uh, dementia unit and one up in the 18 bed loft. Um, so that day we had not started universal masking as Doris had said we were all to be doing weeks ahead of time. But we did start that day, which I think was maybe a day or two ahead of the directive, maybe one day ahead of the directive. And then we, everybody went in their rooms. We just did absolute lockdown, um, no uh, meal dining or anything together. Med passes were door to door. Uh, so then the next day, April 1st, uh, what we decided to do on our dementia care unit, just because they wander so Wendy, much there. Wendy, do you mind if we ask questions throughout? Because actually your presentation is the most important piece today, in okay. my view at least. Yeah, um, I don't. Do you know for a fact if the first gentleman in the retirement floor, yeah. if he got it probably from a staff from outside or was it transferred from somewhere or how? No. Because no. when we make the argument that I know I want to tell you the, the rationale why I'm asking, um, 
when we made the, the argument early on that people needed, that the staff needed to come masked, right, when they come in and that we would have prevented a lot, I still am convinced that that's the case. But do you know the circumstances in your well, place? I don't know how to say this politically correct, but it was, no, we were, politically correct we, were we were already two weeks into that no visitors coming in. So it was definitely staff because that's all that yeah. was allowed in. Um, yeah. And then uh, we do have, uh, I'll, when, you, when I get to the staff, you'll see there's a correlation. Okay. Um, but, yeah, and this very, is very important yeah. because yeah. everybody about, wants to learn how to yeah. do different in a second wave because yeah. there will be likely a second wave etc yeah so and it was about a, a five a five day difference between a date of work and a date of symptoms starting um but uh our health unit only tracked back 48 hours and i think some of that's workload you can't track back much further than 48 hours so they didn't come right out and say that was the re that was where the and we didn't want to publicize that here either. Oh, because, I understand. Yeah. I'm talking from a policy perspective, yes. right? Yeah, definitely. It, it was for staff. The colleagues, for the colleagues online, not only for those of you in long term care, in fact, when we spoke, we said that masking in nursing homes needed to happen before even hospitals, quite frankly. Yeah. Yes. Because our argument was that we knew that those are more compromised people. And we knew that even if they had a chance at using a ventilator, which at the time you may remember, we thought we will be overbooked with ventilators. But even if they did, they will not make it with the ventilator, most of them. So we were determined that they were the first ones that we really needed to protect. So that was the rationale for us. Yeah. And unfortunately, we had talked every day, can we, can we start universal masking? We should be doing universal masking but we couldn't get the PPE in the building. And we were afraid that if we did go into outbreak, the little bit of PPE we had, we would have used up. Marianne, we, you were not alone. I, I was know. fighting every morning with Dr. Williams saying mm -hmm. we need universal masking in nursing yep. homes in the first. Yep. Yeah, so you're not alone. This, this was a system issue. Yeah. Unlike you to fight, Doris, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah, so that was March 31st. So that was day one. Um, I work at two homes, two uh, long term care homes, because the one's so small, I share with another. And the big joke all along was whoever went into outbreak first got me. So my text that morning or that afternoon was, We win. <laughs> From Marianne. Was like, what do you mean? And I said, oh, oh. We're positive. Oh. You get to cut, we get you. Oh. Yeah, and I haven't been back to the other home. Um, and so, so do you work virtually with the other or not? No, the physician there is fantastic. They okay. have enough just doing the physician virtually. They don't need me in there virtually too. So um, yeah, and she covers it. We did different things, but I'm hoping I, uh, that they're good nurses, right? They'll be fine without good. me. I just keep telling them I, I still need a job to come back to. Don't uh, get rid of me completely, but... Anyhow, so then the next day uh, was when we decided just to put all of the residents into their rooms like they were positive because we had no idea who was and who wasn't. So we made that decision on our own. Uh, the health unit did say, yeah, that's a good idea, but it was kind of us who said, we're just going to isolate everybody, which I think was the other very positive thing we did right off the, yeah. the start. Um, and then up in the loft in the retirement home, all the, the staff there wore full PPE when they were working. And there as well, we res isolated all the residents to the rooms. Um, up there, we did not put everybody in like the dementia unit. We just had the high risk contacts that we had identified in full isolation. Um, and then the others was just, um, uh, yeah, what we wore to protect them. So then we had more symptoms and all our symptoms were fevers. We caught all of our residents with fevers. A lot of them had nothing more than a fever. And if you would not have been checking those temps twice a day, they are so important for the residents, more so than the staff. All the residents we caught with temps um, and often no other symptom other than a temp. Um, so we swabbed two more on the second. And they came back positive, of course, again that evening. Okay, next slide. Um, 
And then not until April 5th did we have two more positive fevers. So you can see how long, right? Like it's, there's a length here. Swab two more residents. And um, again, they just had fever and results came back that same day and they were positive as well. So we have, this is where we've really done well. We have had no positive, I'm knocking here, uh, resident swabs. We've done many other swabs. All of them have been negative. We've now done all our surveillance screening in the home and all of those have been negative. So we have had no resident travel, six total. One in the loft, five in our dementia unit. And yeah. amazing that no one else in the loft got the... Uh, no, good. nobody else there has been. And we did the surveillance screening up there as well, and they all came back negative as well. And so, what happened among staff? Uh, uh, that's our next one. So okay. when you look at the, the spread, like the it was 5 out of 15 on the heritage unit, like 30%, which I thought was quite high. And we have had three of those six die. Um, and one is palliative. So we will lose four, four of those six residents, which yeah. is sad. Okay, so that was but residents. Two will, so two will recover, huh? Yep, we got two recovered and we've had so one negative swab. We're gonna do two negatives to get them yeah. out, but, but we've but, had one. But then were they in better, in better overall health or what do you yeah. attribute that to? Yeah. Yep, I would th say they were in better health overall. Mm -hmm. The ones that died were, and there were more mental health issues with the other ones. I think the one had some clear mental health issues, the one from the loft, unfortunately. So um, I think a lot of his issues were he wouldn't do what he needed to do because he was paranoid and which is too bad. He was stronger, but his mental health got in the way that we couldn't manage as well as we wanted to. Yeah. yeah. So then the staff, um, if you go to the next one, next slide. Uh, can I move the slides? Oh, I'm, I'm there. Oh, sorry. I can't see what I'm doing. So, yeah, so this was our first staff. Uh, so her symptoms started a day before our first resident came out with symptoms. Um, she had the positive swab on the 31st. She had worked with that gentleman, the first gentleman on the 25th. So four or five days before symptoms, and then had come down and worked in our heritage unit the next day, which speaks to that cohorting and not moving staff in the home. It's, it was almost um, makes me shiver actually when you see this and how it all plays out. Um, April 3rd, we had another positive in the heritage. She was a high risk. April 4th, we had a, a maintenance guy positive. I, he's our only one that we're like, I don't know where he came from. He could have maybe been a community spread. Um, April 5th, we had one positive in the loft, one in the heritage, both high risk. April 16th, two positive, both high risk. Uh, April 21st, and, and it was the 16th that kind of threw us because there was this big gap, right, from the 5th to the 16th where we thought we were clear with yeah. staff. And then all of a sudden we had fevers and little, and one lost her sense of smell and taste and it was after those atypical symptoms came out and we swabbed them being, yeah, I don't know, and they both came back positive, which freaked us out a bit, I must say. I wasn't expecting them to be positive based on their symptoms. So that's when we, we were one day ahead of everybody else, one or two. We just said we're testing everybody in that heritage unit, and we found two more asymptomatic with that tw on the 21st. So that was aggressive testing that we did that day. Both of them original high-risk contacts as well. They had been working in full PPE the whole time, had worked more than full time because they were some of our dedicated full time staff and had not spread it to any of the residents. So I was like, oh, you guys are like angels, right? Like they, they did everything the way they should have. Um, and then we did that mass screening on the 23rd, 24th. Now I'd love to tell you we still have good news, but we swabbed two more staff today. One that has been working on the unit the whole time, went home with the temp last night at 38.7, felt fine, but went home with the temp, screened in without a temp, went home with the temp. And yeah, so you, you just can't let your guard down. Anyhow, I'm gonna stop talking and let, yeah, so there's our people in their PPE, also are two of our great PSWs frontline that have been with us the whole time and working hard. Um, we love the face shields. I don't know if people have face shields in their facility, but the staff felt 
much, much, much more protected behind a face shield. Yeah, uh, I, the face shields create a lot of extra work. We went through 300 face shields a day with a home our size, um, just with the changing, donning, doffing. So we actually have hired some university students to clean face shields because what we were doing at the end of the day, well, mostly them until I figured out what they were doing, was cleaning these face shields so that they could put them out again to use. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of these hidden things that happen. So I'll let I'll let Marianne talk. So we're very fortunate. Although our home is 26 years old, all of our rooms are private rooms. The dementia unit's a 15 bed unit. It's it's a lovely unit for for the care. There is one central lounge that one of our residents is actually using as her bedroom during this outbreak because she's someone who is often up at night and wanders around with the nursing staff. So she has basically just moved into that lounge unit as her home. Um, but the problem with it being the dementia unit is the residents wander. And in fact, the third case in that unit is a high risk wanderer. So often around four o'clock in the afternoon, if you were to go on the unit, she would be in a isolation gown, gloves. <laughs> she might have a mask on, depends if she had let them leave it on and she would be out wandering around and the staff you had to do what you had to do because you couldn't just keep her in her room anymore so so some of the things that we learned was teamwork we needed to pull on each other's strengths within the organization one person could not do this it was a team that we had to work together to move forward we really needed to look at the processes that we had within the home and what was a priority. The Ministry of Health, as you know, had sent some directives that medication management processes could change, um, documentation processes could change. So right before this had happened, we had actually looked at what were some of the things we could change in our point of care for the PSWs because they spend huge hours documenting point of care tasks. Um, so we had decreased that right before the outbreak happened to make it easier for documenting. Um, we needed to identify who was doing what. So one person took on communication. So Wendy, we were so fortunate, wrote the communication that went out to our families every day. And then our executive director looked after making sure things went out to families, things went out to the staff. Um, our phone line that we set up, she was the one who answered that phone and, and answered the messages and called people back. I took on the PPE and the numerous surveys that we had to report to many different agencies. I think at one point there were four different surveys a day on PPE. Um, myself and the ADOC had to manage staffing. Um, on one day, I had four full-time PSWs called to say they were no longer coming into the building to work because they were afraid. Our scheduler has been off through this whole experience. So, um, and we're a small home, so we don't have a lot of extra resources to pull in someone to do that. Um, so just making sure that someone, we weren't all doing little pieces of something. Someone, that was your role, you took that on and, and you did that respect. Respect goes a long way in this situation and having trust for each other, knowing that that person you're working beside has your back. Um, we spent a lot of time as a leadership team talking the staff down and not, not only the PSWs who were having to deal with changes in their family life, saying goodbye to their kids because they were working in a COVID positive home where they could no longer you know, be with their kids anymore. But even the registered staff were really needed a lot of talking down and encouragement. And then we couldn't have done this without Wendy. There is um, no doubt she has supported us all the way through it through quickly being able to change the workload with the registered staff by changing the med passes to once a shift as much as possible. She's been doing her own orders, putting them into point click care for the staff doing all the communication to their families, it's, we just, 
we wouldn't be where we are if we didn't have that support. Mm -hmm. That is a definitely a nursing issue. I would say that first week, I felt abandoned. That was the only word I could use, except for the people within the four walls. Um, you felt like, yeah, nobody would even come to the door that first week. And if they did, they dropped and ran. And that includes the physicians. We have not had physicians step in. Yeah. And I can't imagine a workload of doing it virtually when you're in the midst of an outbreak. Um, I, there's just, they don't have time to virtually uh, assess and, and communicate, um, right? It, it just, I don't know how, uh, I think that's a huge thing. If somehow you can get NPs in every home, um, mm. especially those in outbreak, that would be, um, especially ones that know the residents. That was the other bonus with me. I've been there for four years, so I know them well. But so although we're a 45 bed home, we have 12 different physicians who come into our home to see our residents. Yeah. So already before this had happened, our medical director had agreed that he would take on the residents within our home so that we weren't having to communicate with different physicians. Yeah. Um, so Wendy has been dealing with every medical issue that has come up in this time for all of the residents. And I have in the retirement home too, just because I work closely with that physician so I can do the assessing and I can write orders. And so I just have kind of taken that on as well. So that's our teamwork talk. Mm -hmm. So our next slide is on community. Do you have a question? Before you move on to the next yeah. slide, there okay. were a couple of questions. May I ask okay. that? Sure, yeah. Um, one, one was uh, from Janice, and she's asking about the protocol for the retirement area. And she said, when you said that all staff wore full PPE after the first resident was diagnosed with COVID, do you mean including face shield? I think this probably means gowning and yes. working with others because she's wanting to use some of your policy. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Droplet precautions. And we have goggles here too, but the staff, I, I think too, we just all feel better with that the face shields through this like usually you, you feel okay with goggles I don't know this one's different <laughs> this one just feels different mm -hmm. um, for us all so okay and there's another question from Paula saying um, families do not visit especially in long-term care is this the area that we need um, to review right now as the pandemic continues so I don't know if you want to talk about that now or later uh, you know what, a lot of families, I don't, even through this outbreak, they are not asking to come in. Uh, I think because they realize the risk they are to the resident. Um, so I still think it's too early to open those doors. But yes, it's been five, six weeks now, I think, that they haven't seen their loved one, which is painful. But um, I still don't think we're at a point where I would open our yeah. door. You know, um, you know Wendy? Um, I question the whole approach with families. Uh, I will tell you which ones I question. A lot of reflection on that of people that are about to die. Yeah, I and we've let them in. Yeah, we've let them in. But in most places they don't. Yeah. And I do oh, okay. we've let them they in. Yep. They do come in in for PPE. One. That One. I agree. Yep. Yeah. I agree. But in most places they're not let in. And okay. they have not said goodbye to their people. Oh, and I think yeah, it's no. a big mistake. Yeah, no. no, I agree. We let them in. Yeah. But we let one in. We discuss what the risks are at home by coming in, right? Like we give them the choice. Yeah. Um, and then allow them to decide when they want to be here. The one who's dying now, we've got a cot in her room. We're doing it like we would have done. And she wears full PPE when she's in and uh, behaves like we do when we go home. Kind of work isolate. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I do think the other thing um, if, uh, that you were talking about one and per uh, each nursing home, that's ex you know that that's the position of our any pre COVID yep. even. Yes. I and I think one, this, um, yeah, this just, this and I think it should be always, right? I've always, always felt. Always, yeah. always. But I think well, the, COVID, the COVID will bring this pudding. to light. The proof is in the pudding. You guys were okay. there all the time physically and the reality is that others doctors you know they were not they 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 no, no. you know they the, the nursing home is not their primary income no 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 
So yeah, the communication is the key. And I think our communication with families has made them feel like they don't have to come in, like just to answer that question. Um, so uh, we did not do so well with staff. I guess if we could turn back the clock and change something. I think we were very uh, good at communicating with families off the hop because I knew that would be, we all knew that would be a big issue. But I think by the end of the day, we were exhausted and we did not probably communicate as well uh, with them. And especially the unaffected unit. I think we were on the two affected units, but that poor unaffected unit, I think felt like they had no clue what was going on. Um, so uh, we're doing much better with that now. But um, you have to figure out a way to communicate with the staff. What we have is this one call. Uh, so you've got emails that go out with pushing one button to everybody uh, for both family and staff. So a POA for everybody that you're communicating with and staff. So that's something you could proactively do is set that up. Um, because when this hits, you just need to be able to communicate very clearly and succinctly. And we were that's very, very good. Transparent. Like we were honest, we made sure that um, whatever was happening, we we told the families up front before it was released to the media. So we didn't want a press release from public health to come out before we had told our families and our staff what had happened. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So unfortunately, I had to tell them today, we have two pending swabs from symptomatic staff, right? It's just like, oh, I can't believe we have to do this again but we've been trying to do that. So um, the other thing we did set up was a special phone line. Uh, so a, a different number so that they weren't calling the charge nurse all the time. Um, and they would leave questions there and then somebody would get back to them. Um, did you have a question, Susan, before I go on? Is that you holding your hand up? Yeah, it was. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Tanisha has a question about um, communicating with families, how often, weekly, daily, or as phone uh, calls came in? In and outbreak, it was daily. I And I still am doing a daily update. I, I think I've sent it out to Doris. You've got yes, a couple of it's, it's in the blog from Saturday, guys. Yeah, yeah. So I do a daily update. I, I do a little spiel. I'm a very good chatter. I can chat about different things, a little light hearted <laughs> stuff. And then I always comment on the cases, the active cases, how many we've got how many have resolved, how many deaths, and then how many pending swabs for every unit. And I do that with staff as well. And then I always comment on PPE. The first day I called all the residents, families um, on Heritage just to tell them this was what was happening um, that first day. And I, what I did, because they asked the same questions. So I said, I will write your questions down and I will answer them all in my communication <laughs> tomorrow. And that's kind of what I, we did. As we had questions come in, I'd say, you know what, excellent question. I will, I'll just send that out to everybody. So that's I did that along with it too. Lisa, Wendy, do you think that those questions and answers would be good for us, some of them to post? <laughs> would they be the same as in other places? I don't, I would think, like a lot asked, can I, should I take my loved one home. That was a big one. Um, yeah, I, got, I, I even got that one. Yeah. From families. Yeah. So I think I sent you my first one was the big mass questions, like the first phone call of heightened um, anxiety from everybody. So that was, and then it was after that, they often just wanted to know how everybody was, right? Like, how are the residents doing? So I tried to say it in a way, but um, that was kind and respectful. And I, I did get consent from the residents' families that I was okay to share that with the whole group before there was a death, right? So it kind of preemptively, so then it wasn't such a shock when all of a sudden somebody died, right? You could say there's a couple that are really not doing well, um, kind of guarded prognosis. And then the families for our active cases, the registered staff call them every day. Yes, that was so they're the only ones who get a personal phone call mm -hmm. is so that they get a yeah. personal update on how their resident is doing. Yeah, and I, we, we, we made that out with them. We'll call you once a day. We'll give you a 24-hour update. Just trust that we will call if anything changes in between. And they respected, the families have respected that. Like we used to get how many calls the first couple of days? Oh. oh, 
It was, that's all you do was manage calls. That's all I did the first two days. And when we got that in place, like we, I don't think I've been called personally about anything um, in funny. a week. Yeah, it, it has. It really worked. Yeah really worked. The other thing we did, because I, we used, we at management, you get all these wonderful emails coming in, right? And these great, right? Keep up the good work, all these positive, happy vibes, lots of prayers. So we Sounds started like posting coffee. them. We have this beautiful, and I've got a picture at the end, our thank you board. So we posted so that everybody sees them. We meet with our public health unit every day, and they have been tremendous. We have a fantastic health unit. So I would, um, highly recommend that you do. We set a time, we meet every morning, whether we have anything to discuss or not. Um, and uh, we have recently started meeting with our local hospital who has helped with some of the staffing issues. Once they had the directive to deploy staff, they've been uh, very supportive of that. Which one is your hospital? Stratford General. So it's- Right, uh, right, right. Health, right. Health per, what is it? Um, HPHA? H yeah, Sternberg Healthcare Alliance. Yeah, but it's Stratford General is yeah. is our hospital. Great. Okay, staffing. This is Marianne's baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, like I said, the one day um, the poor PSW who was number four to call me to say that she wasn't coming to work anymore because she couldn't work in a COVID positive home. I think I just said thank you for letting me know and hung up on her. I called her afterwards to apologize, but um, she was number four in an hour and a half to say they weren't coming for their shift. So we lost 18 nursing staff, full and part-time staff, four laundry and housekeeping staff, seven dietary staff. But so that total, was only because they were afraid or because they were in self-isolation or because no, they were- because they were afraid or they lived with someone who was immunocompromised. Most of them were afraid. Or yeah. their husband you would know lose their job. Yeah. yeah, a lot of them we had issues with their spouse um, because they worked here, their spouse would be laid off of their position. So things that we didn't think would happen, we yeah. all of a sudden had to deal with. So 30% 30, 30 of our staff were wow. gone within the first probably the first three to four days. Yeah. So already we're trying to staff up because we're now feeding everyone in their rooms. We're staff are donning and doffing PPE all the time. The management team was spending four hours a day cleaning face shields after already working an 11 hour day. Um, so, and then just spending the time to figure out who was actually gonna show up the next shift. So, Yes, talk to your staff now, figure out what their home life is like. Explain, you cannot walk out of this building because you're now in a COVID outbreak. Um, there needs to be some preparation and know who's gonna be here and who isn't gonna be here. We had already had conversations with some of the staff around childcare to have a plan in place. And unfortunately, they just weren't able to get that done, so. Marian, um, what about during flu season? Do you also lose a lot of stuff? Um, we had already done that before the outbreak. No, um, but it, I'm talking in norm in, in normal, normal outbreak. Yeah. No. no, oh no, no. This is different. This one is different than no, influenza. I know. I know people are yeah. afraid. I was just yeah. more people curious. are terrified. They're, they're not terrified. just afraid. Yeah, yeah. People are terrified. Yeah. What about you? Were, were you afraid at any point, you yourself, guys? Uh, I used to just cry going yeah. to and from work. I wasn't no, fearful was for my life. I wasn't That's fearful exhausting. for my life. Yeah, I think I was afraid I would take it home to my family. Um, yeah. yeah. But it, this is what we do. We, yeah. we come to work and we care for our residents. Yeah, and, and I was afraid no, for the no, residents. Just, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was afraid for what it was going to look like for the residents. Mm -hmm. Like, knowing as soon as we had a positive and knowing that we weren't to be transferring our residents to acute care, were we, what was death going to look like? Yeah. Knowing that yeah. they were going to die and how bad was it going to be? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. was our whole home going to be yeah. COVID yeah. positive? It's the unknown and you didn't, yeah. I didn't know what, what to expect. You kind of know what to expect with influenza. Uh, this one, I had, had no idea what to expect. So what, I, what we found with the course of the illness, with the seniors anyway, is they kind of tick along, not bad, 
till about day five. So you kind of either know day five to seven if they're going to make it or if they're going to turn um, around that day. Um, and then the fevers last forever. Like the fevers lasted for eight, nine days with most of them. And like, always at night. Yeah. Yeah. And they get Tylenol. See, most of these guys get Tylenol through the day. So always check a temp during the night. Actually, that's quite important. Um, and then we were afraid how they were going to die. I can assure you all that long-term care does end of life beautifully. It is no different for a COVID patient than it is for any other patient we care for at end of life. The only thing you shouldn't do or can't do is write the aerosolized things. So just no nebulizers, um, even no fans, no CPAP, uh, those, no suctioning end of life, but we tend not to do a lot of that anyway. So um, that's the only thing that we've done is said we're not doing these things end of life. And you just use hydromorphin, scopolamine, and a lot of the good medications that we already use, Nozanan has been good um, to help with that. Is there a question, Susan? Well, there, there are lots of really good questions. Um, I'm also looking at the time. So this is this is great momentum with oh, this. Geez. It's also <laughs> 7 30. <730. laughs> um, one option would be that we wait and do a cheer at the very end. Yes, no one will know. We will, <laughs> tell, them that, we will tell them that we just um, made it longer. <laughs> If that's okay with everyone, because there are some really good questions, and, and I know so that so, the flow is so good and the yeah. presentation is awesome. I listen, uh, Susan. We have taped this, right? Yes, Olivia is yes. recording it. Good, Marianne and Wendy. You have already three quarters of an article written, darling. <laughs> <laughs> For real, we will help you. I promise we help yeah. you. Yeah, right away, Doris. Yeah. Right away. Yeah. We'll <laughs> no, but we can, no, but we can we can offer to transcribe for you. Okay. And then you will I can offer for you to ask questions so you fill in the gaps. Okay. And the same as others publish in the BMJ or whatever J. You mm -hmm. can do because you have done awesome work and you have measured a lot of things. Yeah, I've already done my 300 to 500 word homework. If you recall, <laughs> we, will, we will help. I will help you under your name for the 2000 word homework. Ah. <laughs> questions you will answer like you did for your patients, for your residents and families. I will ask one a day. <laughs> Okay. Can I can I ask one question, kind of a personal question for you, um, and then maybe you continue, and then we can go back to all the questions if that's okay. Um, Wendy's asking. She's saying the staffing issues are often the most difficult thing to deal with in any sort of crisis. But are you concerned that key people, you two and others, are burning the candle at both ends? Fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Very much so. I think I did 11 days straight. Um, I was a little more of the mental health. We can't keep doing this. Yes, right? yes. Wendy, uh, Wendy hello. has been our grounder. You work five days, you take one off. You work five days, you take one off. I'm now working on them taking two days off. Uh, yeah, so work Wendy, five days, take two yeah, days off. That's the Wendy's way the world five. works. We're still at set. We're at six now, I think. We're doing six and one off. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've tried. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, at the beginning, there just I wasn't can, the opportunity. I can um, totally understand. Yeah. And that's where um, you need to, you just need to fill in where you need to fill in. So we're on the unit at mealtimes to, mm -hmm. to help the residents eat. Because when they're all in their rooms, it's our dementia unit. Those residents cannot eat alone. Even the residents who could eat alone in yes. the communal <laughs> dining, where you just had to have a conversation, you're now in their room having to, to assist them because they've lost that ability. Yeah. Um, our dietary manager has been working more than full-time hours in the dietary department because he lost over half of his department in one foul soup as well. Um, so it's... Everyone has just been doing what they need to do. Our conference room of the home has become, we call it our war room. We mm -hmm. have our PPE locked up in here because we were 
a bit concerned that it was going out too fast, so we keep it under control here. Our teleconference phone is here, so that's where we do our calls with public health and um, the hospital every day. And then we're our tables are spread out so we can social distance, but it's where we come and say, okay, what are you up to? What are you doing now? What do you need me to do for you? Things like that. And then mental health, as I talked about, just supporting each other. There were some really, there still are some very hard feelings around how the staff working on our positive unit were treated by the staff on the unit that was clear. Um, wow. If they happened to come in the building at the same time, it was like, oh, like, don't stand so close to me, get away from me. And yeah. if the affected unit called for support from the staff and the unaffected unit, it was like, I can't come over there. Like, you guys are sick. So, so there's some hard feelings that we need yeah. to work through. Um, just how, whenever, what our new normal will look like and how do we mend those feelings. So, yeah. That will not be easy. No, and the relationships of the staff amongst themselves is a big yep. piece of that too. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah, you and and some may not come back to work. Just so you know, as a result of SARS, yeah. um, first of all, a lot of what you describe happened in SARS, not only among staff, but even at the at the fuel tank, they will yeah. not, you know, help them. But uh, I know of at least three uh, RNs that never came back to work. Yeah. They just didn't. They had PTSD, one left the province and so forth. Yeah. yeah. And I did, I have I've called a very close friend who I know will keep me honest after week one. And I said, I will need counseling at the end of this. I don't have time now, but don't let me not do that, right? Because you know how you think, oh, I'll be okay, I'll be okay. I was not okay that first week especially when they came out with those changes in the death um, protocols, that's when I lost it completely. Like they touched every single process of what we do, stripped it away. And now we're asking nurses to put bodies in awful body bags and, and not do our, our honor guards to say goodbye. Families can't, like, I was just like, ah, this is, this can't happen. So um, I'm going to need counseling. Again, I will hold the rest of the management team to that too, because uh, yeah, I think there could be some some issues down the road and we're going to be arranging some mental health too. We've talked about that as well. It's just, when do you do that? When is the timing? Because it's not the beginning, that's for sure. And we're not out yet, so it's not now. Um, yeah. 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 Wendy, you're just so wise. I'm, I'm so impressed and you're wise. so right. And this is a huge issue that is going to be affecting um, healthcare workers for some time yeah. to come. Yeah. So like you're the one time I was as well. I don't think people work in long term care to be frontline workers, right? Like I'm running over there, that poor lady seized and had sats of seventy two percent. I'm like, what is I did not sign up for this, right? Mm -hmm. I am not a eMERGE nurse with need of that high adrenaline. <laughs> I like things to just, I like to kind of, yeah, where I don't think anybody in long-term care ever mm -hmm. anticipated we would be frontline, right, in a pandemic. But, then but, but, every did, but, Wendy, but Wendy, we did, if you go back to our reports, and that's why we fought so hard. Yes, thank uh, you. And did not successfully until later on. But we did the moment I remember being watching the news, the 9 p.m. CBC, when they were talking about the, again, the shortage of vents that I had been talking with the hospitals and with Williams and all of them. And when I realized, because I got, I call it on the black market, the report on what we had in the province, the penny drop, and I remember calling Lisa Levin. Lisa Levin is from Advantage, Ontario, 10 p.m and saying, Lisa, 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 we will have residents dying by the huge numbers. We are not protecting them. We need to fight for PPE. We need to fight for masking. We need to fight for testing. And we went like all, all the way. And it took the first, this is before the hospitals did masking. Then I got three COs from hospitals 
because I wrote about in the blog saying you will be happy to hear we are going to start with the masking. And I remember saying to each one of them, I'm thrilled. I need to hear the same about long-term care. They need the PPE, they need to be masking, they need to protect their residents, they need to protect their staff. And yeah. it took a lot longer. Every single day we fought, every mm -hmm. And but thank you, thank I you. Was, I know, oh, for, but, for me but, it was when we had the first death in Canada was from a long-term care in BC. Yeah, I was in like, BC. okay, mm -hmm. here we go. I knew yeah. then, right, that this is going to be our issue. This is going to be a long-term care issue. But um, anyhow, my last slide, just so that you don't get stuck listening to us all along, is that don't let your guard down, right? Like truly, truly screen staff when they come in and uh, don't come to work if you're sick. So they Zoom me in at my other home. I do uh, Zoom Wednesday meetings. Uh, it's, what is, what do they call it? Wednesday, Wendy, Zoom with Wendy on Wednesdays or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I can talk very candidly to that home. And I have been very, I said, you do not grumble on the front line. If somebody calls in sick, you do not uh, like give them issues because they need to be at home. And I don't know what it is. I have a sister-in-law who is always sick. I, I can call her every second day and she's got the worst cold she's ever had. Some people just are, right? Mm -hmm. They're just more prone to getting sick and you have to just respect that. I'm one of the lucky ones that doesn't and I come to work every day and that is a blessing. Then, but you don't want people coming in sick, so screen. And then for registered staff, sometimes there's an issue where they don't always listen, maybe as well as they should to what the PSWs are saying who are on the front line. So again, I would say that's huge. You need to go see that re resident. You need to actually assess them. And we used to just isolate any change. You just put them in isolation and watch because they're hard to assess. That's the reality, right? So we were very cautious. And then I think we've all learned more about those atypical presentations. So we have had staff with just the olfactory taste changes with positive swallows, maybe a little scratchy throat, but that's it. Um, and our residents, as we know, can't tell us those atypical okay. symptoms really. And then Don and Doff PPE, like it's the first time, right? You can't get sloppy with it. So I guess those would be our- And the hands. And washing your hands, yeah. sorry. I should have, and Mary Ann's very yeah. good at that. Big yeah, time. yeah, yeah. Yes. I think you say it in every communication. Every communication, <laughs> wash your hands. Wash your hands, wash, wash your hands. Because if not the donning and doffing will do nothing, right? You're yeah. correct, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, that's why I don't talk about it because Mary Ann does all the time, so. Uh, so, and there's just some photos of some of the the beautiful stuff that's been put up in our oh, home. Lovely. Yeah, it's <laughs> overwhelming. So we had a family, three families went together and made that quilt. Thank you to the heroes. In front oh. of it is the residents that have deceased in the time that we've been in outbreak oh. that we usually set up. And then we have this whole table of, and let me tell you, the food pours in here. We, I don't know, there's one day I haven't had food that you know, you don't have to bring a lunch to work. We keep telling the staff this is not going to last forever. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, yeah, beautiful. the community has been overwhelming, overwhelming. Do you so, think that, do you find that that's in general the case or is because your home is a bit smaller? I don't, we're in a I small community. Yeah. So it's very local. There's just two nursing homes or two long-term care homes in Stratford. So I would assume that Spruce Lodge, the other one, would be treated, and they probably are treated, because a lot of the, the community, um, uh, like not even, not even families, so a lot of families donate, they want something to do. So we've had loads of families, but a lot of it is just- A lot of it's community where different restaurants and yeah. companies in town have, you know, Today is the day Tim Hortons is bringing you donuts and coffee. Mm -hmm. Or um, one company brought, sent in pizza the one day. But then, yes, our families have done things as well. Actually, the other nursing home in town bought our staff pizza one day. Yeah. So. And, and we put the families their first mission because that's what you realize is they yep. want to do something. So um, we were struggling to get goggles and face shields. So we put it out there. I said, if you want to help, 
right? This is how you can help. We need, we go through 300, well, and then we were just figuring out how many we were using. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't, you'd be amazed the amount of people that just dropped goggles, companies that would bring stuff in and somebody really? actually got all the face shields yes. for us. Yeah. And, the um, Rotary in town got us face shields and. Yeah. So yeah, it's been, uh, those communications, those amazing. daily communications have been the key. Cause I did, I just put a little, if you want to help, this is what we need. And then a little while later, we were like, okay, staff could use water and Gatorade, right? Because we didn't want them taking reusable bottles onto the units or anything, unfortunately. Um, and then, yeah, we still have stores. We had water. 20 <laughs> cases of water within, I think, eight hours. Yeah, mm -hmm. that they just want to help. Beautiful, just beautiful. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, Susan. Hello, Susan. Hand up again. All right. Well, well, they're just so. Well, first Someone of all, I just want to tell you that there's there is a, so much appreciation in the chat box, thanking you That's for your amazing. honesty, your perspective, mm -hmm. your insight, um, and and many affirmations about your need for for taking care of your own me mental health, your well being. Um, people are thanking you for, for being so caring, um, for being honest and for, you know, saying that it's really important for you to process your emotions. So, so much gratitude for this webinar, really. Um, and people are wanting to see, have access to your slides. I think, I think we can post the whole webinar. I just yes, think we, we will. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then there are probably about 10 questions and it's 744. So how do we want to spend Let's the next? Let's go for them. Let's go for them quickly. <laughs> some of okay. us will stay, some of go us need questions to, and we have to stay quiet. Then we have to make noise. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, um, maybe asleep. I've got a, I've got a grouping of a few, um, about the, in our residents expressing feeling scared. Are they asking to see a pastor or a priest? And yeah. where are people dying? Can yeah. I group yep. those together? Yep. So the more cognitively well, yes, are wanting to know. I have one resident that um, I actually, we saw increased use of Haldol and Trazodone PRN. And I realized she wasn't getting any information. So I print my communication for families and I make sure she gets a printed copy every day, which has helped her significantly. Um, other, when we did all the surveillance screening, I gave it to the families. I said, you know them well enough. If you think they can, they would do better with having pre-warning that they're getting swabbed tomorrow morning, you let them know. If not, we will just be letting them know when we go in. Um, the residents with dementia, I think, miss their families terribly, like terribly, and will see huge changes in cognition, physical ability at the end of this. Like they're not going to be as good, I'm sure. Did, did and you try I've to seen do that with already. them uh, iPad so, or something? So, yeah, we tried to do the Skyping with families mm -hmm. and we have different um, window visits, window visits and things like that. But with the residents who were our positive cases, that wasn't always possible. So yeah. And they could get prescription, right? Like this is weird. So I, it, it works for some beautifully, others not so beautifully. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of people come to come to windows, right? And the windows are all decorated as well. And yeah, there's a lot of beautiful things happening with that. The rec staff have been fantastic with connecting them. And that was another thing I had put in my daily communications, right? Like this is who you connect with if you want to be part of this. And we really encourage Pastoral, we have a chaplain as part of our uh, service here, which is a beautiful thing. Um, she hasn't been in physically, but she has made a lot of phone calls to those who would know um, and then did a lot of the um, end of life care over the phone with our residents and families or with families mainly. She calls the spouses, um, tries to c connect with them at least once a week. Um, and uh, we did have one die without last rites that I feel sick about, uh, but I think we have a plan um, for the next time to help support that uh, piece at the end of life. Um, so I guess that's how we're managing it here. I actually uh, play the piano. So part of my mental health is um, after lunch, all I play are hymns, by the way, but after lunch on the Heritage Unit, I sit down and play <laughs> for about 30, 45 minutes. And uh, it, I think it helped. It helped all of us. Yeah. 
<laughs> everybody's mental health, especially mine, because it is a way to relax. And the residents love old hymns. Like, let me tell you, we can sing old hymns. And now I've got all the young staff singing old hymns too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah. So that's, I guess that's how we're, we're doing that piece. Great. That's amazing. Uh, How many years are you both working there? How long? I think it's been here for, it'll be eight years. This month, actually, it was eight years this month. I worked in long-term care for 30. Yeah. And I wow. have worked in long-term care since I was 14. So that puts me at about 36 years <laughs> in wow. all, all different roles. And I've been here for four years. I was part of that first amazing. funding wave. Yeah. So, Just amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's a good team here. It's a really yeah. good team here. Well, it really shows, Wendy, your uh, love Passion. of uh, the residents and the whole sector because you've done such a wonderful I job. know. I wish oh we could God. sell it more. I've always, I always, I love taking students. I'm like, this is the best place to work. Look at how complex these residents are. So I've worked as a, a PSW, then I was a CNS. I was a director of care um, and now an NP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've done almost every nursing role. Amazing. I so wouldn't do that role. That's a good, that's a, that's a really good nurse, is that role. <laughs> Susan, you have more questions, Susan? Yeah, I do. I do. What, maybe I'll tag one on to, to that one, talking about roles. Uh, Judy Lynn is asking if there are certain qualifications needed that um, that you can outline in terms of the role of an RN that could be brought in as a result of the urgent request for long-term care. Mm, say that one more time. I just want yeah. to make sure I understand. And, and Judy, Judy Lynn, you might need to, to clarify or be prepared to answer in the chat box. Are there certain qualifications needed? And can you outline the role of an RN that could okay. be brought in okay. as a result of the urgent request for long-term yeah. care? Yeah. I know that's one of the challenges because it is a very different kind of work for an RN here mm -hmm. in a long-term care home than it is in probably every other kind. You, you don't just have four or five residents that you're looking after completely. Right? It's more um, that over... So, so, so if it's somebody that's never, so the question I understand it is if it's somebody that has not had any long-term mm -hmm. care experience, what kind of role could an RN have in the facility without knowing the residents, number one, and having a really good orientation? Is that, do you that think that sounds like a good, yeah, mm -hmm. that sounds good to me, yeah, and Julie, an, Julie Lynn affirms that's correct. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, I would, we would have taken anyone to do anything. So just to be an extra person here to help with, yeah. with the meals, to help with the resident care, to help do the resident assessments. Um, would we have put you on our med cart and expected you to know EMAR? No, but there would have been a way that you could have helped and some of it is, is the basic nursing tasks, yeah. right? Like it's it's feeding people, it's, it's toileting honest. people, it's mm -hmm. helping with the lift, it's yeah, yeah, it's getting somebody dressed and ready for the day. Um, yeah. Because despite this outbreak, those girls, the PSWs on the unit, everyone was still up and dressed. Yeah. Like care was still, people weren't nursed in bed. They maintained a normal routine through yeah. all of this, as much as what normal could be. Yeah. And to Judy, and this depends on which is the home, because Heather and I had the conversation with another home where after one shift, they actually do ask them to do the meds, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Just depends on how short they are yeah. And, yeah. and what's yeah. the situation. And what that yeah. means in terms of being able to manage that for a large number of people. Yeah. 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 And they'd have to make it smaller. You couldn't expect somebody walking in to do a med pass for 30 residents. You'd have to just pick off 15 of those, I would think. I don't know how you do that, but uh, like that's almost, I don't know. That's that's really overwhelming for an RN yeah, who's never done it. Just and this is not just whichever resident. These are residents that if they have COVID positive, yeah, they're slower yeah. in drinking and oh. slower in... Well, and even on a good day, there's a, there's a knack to getting these people to take their pills. And it's mm -hmm. not just, here are your oh, pills. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's crushing, which a lot of, right? Like, yeah. It's well, crushing. I would think, Wendy, it just brought, draws to everybody's attention this fact that this is a specialty area of practice that mm -hmm. needs but these, strong levels of skill. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we staff up, so we, put so we put 24 hour registered staff in our small unit where normally we would just have one RPN on days and a four hour RPN shift on evenings. So we have 24 seven registered staff in that unit. So perhaps with some, you know, to bring someone onto the night shift where hopefully it is a little bit quieter with care, that would be a role perhaps for someone who's never worked in long term care. But again, with some really strong PSWs who know the residents well, mm -hmm. that they can tell you they're changing. Yeah. I mean, the reality is that the nurses that you're getting from the hospital, many of them have never done long-term um, care. Actually, mm -hmm. we've been pretty fortunate with the staff we've received from the hospital. Oh, they're wow. actually staff who worked in our home previously oh, wow. and are still That's in our casual pool. So, That's lucky. Yes, so we, we really lucked out. It's a small town. There yeah. are some beauties with small town. Yeah. Actually, a lot of beauties with small town. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Susan, you have more questions? There are. They just keep on being more. Five questions. to eight, Susan. Five one. to eight. <laughs> okay. I'm interested, Susan. Yeah. Well, I think there, um, maybe some of these questions I think we can answer that aren't necessarily specific to your home. Um, as far as like clinical management and PPE questions, those kinds of things. Um, I just wanted to say that there's a suggestion that this is a basis, webinar could be the basis of a great documentary. The public oh, needs yes. to hear this story. Wendy uh, already did the documentary. Did you, did you uh, watch yes. that documentary? Did you? What, did you yes. watch it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. For better or worse, I didn't know the questions they were throwing at us either. It was it was very round table. Yeah, Heather and um, Irma Jean, you've been looking at the chat box too, wondering if there's anything that stands out to you that you want to make sure that we ask as sort of a final question. Otherwise, some of the rest of them um, we'll try to bring forth. Thanks for asking, because there is a question that uh, what about families that want continuous live video transmission? What protection is there for staff? What privacy protection is there as live constant video oh, chat issue. can be recorded by parties who are not within the health circle? I don't know if that was at all a consideration. We didn't have any family who requested that. We haven't ever had to deal with um, any type of security camera request from a family. So we actually had very positive relationships with family. I think that's the key is this because they do, they do, they trust that we will call them if something's not yeah. right. And uh, so, yeah, we have not had that issue, thankfully. So, yes, yeah. good. And, you know, Wendy, the fact that you had families uh, with their loved ones as they were dying, I think is amazing. And I'm not sure that's difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I don't know. yeah, I think they said we could decide. Yeah, we, we, mm -hmm. we do abide by the one person yeah. rule, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. I, that's, that's just cruel. Sense. It's just cruel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to say that we've got many, many, we'll copy the, we'll copy the chat box for you because I know you haven't been able to keep track of it. Um, many, many thank yous to both of you. Oh, for yeah. You. yeah, we will send you. Yeah, and we'll I have to send it to you because it's just fabulous. The, the comments that people are sharing about your sharing of your experiences, yeah. your transparency, your honesty, your um, vulnerableness. Um, yeah. So just thank you so much for that. And we'll, we'll, we'll share the chat with you just so you yeah, can see what comments people have made. Me because I will include some of that in the blog. And I also will post Wendy and Mary and the documentary in the blog. Yeah, okay. yeah, because they did around that. And when I'm, I've forgotten what day that was. I've lost track. That was last Tuesday. Last was week. Almost a week ago. Yeah, a week we ago. Oh man, already. already, okay. So yeah. so maybe with the remaining time, we should um, do our cheer. Oh, right. Yeah, I think so. And kind yeah, of we close with that here, here, here. <laughs> We need a, um, um, Olivia needs to promote people. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, so if, working on that right now. Yeah, if you'd like to be featured on the screen for the video for our share, if you can please just type in the chat box and I'll promote you to panelists and then that way we'll be able to see your faces and hear your voices. Thanks. So maybe, um, uh, Heather, did you, well, well, Olivia's doing that. Did you want to just highlight some of the resources that we, we have in long-term care while we're just getting some- Sure, I can do that. Absolutely. Thanks for reminding me. Yes, absolutely. Cause that was something I was to do at the end. So on the um, portal, the new portal of rneo.ca uh, slash COVID-19, you'll be able to find a large number of resources that we're continuing to uh, develop for long-term care specifically, but also for many other sectors, you'll be able to find the recording for this session tonight, as well as um, Doris's blog, um, tools that have been created and, and uh, summarized for mental health services, our links to our Facebook pages. Again, reminding you that we have a Facebook site for um, uh, family members of residents in long-term care specifically. We've got almost 200 uh, participants in that. Lots of dialogue and some of you that are on the call today are participating in that as uh, members. And we also have two others, one peer-to-peer peer -peer -peer support and one for emerging issues. So please do have a look at that if that would be helpful to you. Um, we're trying to find ways of meeting the needs that you have and I think the uh, redesign of the portal has been a fabulous way uh, to be able to find the information more easily and of course Doris's um, regular updates uh, get connected to the blog and then in her or sorry the portal and then her own personal blog um, helps you find the information that you need and Susan uh, you're going to talk about uh, together we can do it so why don't you go ahead and do that. Um, well which you you may have been hearing this in your own neighborhood every night. I hope you're participating actively in uh, making noise, playing music, celebrating, and um, and posting your celebration online with our uh, Together We Can Do It hashtag, tagging RNAO, and cheer for health workers. So if you're active on Twitter, um, you can check out all the excellent, amazing, wonderful posts. And going. I absolutely need people to post more because every day I pick some for my blog. So you will be featured around the world with your own art and your own music and your own classic and fans. Ready? Yeah, I think so. But I don't see our BPSO people on the line and others. This is fabulous. Oh, okay, you have a lot of people. <laughs> I don't see a lot of people. Yeah, I see Barbara Anderson. I see you, girl. Hi, Sarah. Bravo. Well, I have to say that, that Doris, you have something new every day. I'm using the same old um Corsita is doing some dancing for us as well. With her. I see yeah. that. That's fabulous. <laughs> They're all resonating on my singing bowl. Hi, Teresa. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Oh, nice. Thank you, thank you very much to everyone. Amazing, and a special thank you to Marianne and to Wendy. Just fantastic. Yeah. Fabulous. Just fabulous. Fabulous. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh. Bravo, that's right. See you next week, guys. Miss you already. Okay, what are we going to do when this is over? We are all developing <laughs> a bit of addiction <laughs> to being connected a Don't lot. Don't worry about it. We'll find you, something. You, will. <laughs> you know what? I mean it. I mean it in many ways. I know you do. We'll find something, something Dora. Not to worry. <laughs> we'll fix the system. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Susan, for hosting. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 What he is getting asked today is a sort of a criteria for when uh, public health measures.
Good night, Doris. Good night, everybody. Decrease in new cases for two to four weeks, especially in hospital cases and ones that can't be traced.